Hello, you're listening to the HatchetJob.com gaming netcast. I'm here with Dan Joe. Hello. And Lupus. Salutations. Thank you. For, for, it's, we're past Christmas. Who says salutations these days? <laughs> Only people who go to Ren fairs say salutations. Wait, does salutations mean hello or goodbye? I think it doesn't mean hello. Is it like is it like aloha? Does it mean both? Greetings. It, Sim, your English. What yes. do salutations mean? I, I believe it can be used in in both contexts. So lupus, thank you for that. And uh, medium. And uh, and simplicity, you are the new girl on the block. Hi there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's slightly worrying. We haven't been together for a while. It's true. We, we haven't spoken for a while, so I suspect this year is going to be very awkward. Uh, but I would like to share with you that Predator 2 was on television just before I came up to record. You said we weren't allowed to have any sounds in the background. No, I, I said before I came up to record. Oh, okay. I, I was just going to turn the TV on. Well, no, no, don't do that. So no, no love for Predator 2? Oh, yeah, I love Predator 2. Did you watch all of it? I, I got to the bit where the Jamaicans were having a stereotypical voodoo killing um, after the drug dealer was having sex, and that's all I got to. Classic. It is classic. I understand why people think it's not as good as the first one, but I still really like it. I like, I like Predator 2. Why do you think they don't think it's as good as the first one? Uh, the first one's a bit more pure. Pure. <laughs> it's <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it, it spends more time, I think, as just, you know... One guy versus the Predator, with, like, no dialogue. The first one's more thoughtful. Perhaps. Perhaps. But I like how the second one has kind of, uh, in a movie way, uh, encapsulated what everybody felt about, like, uh, living in a city at that time. Because that was, like, right before crime dropped off for no apparent reason. And so everybody, it's got this vibe of, like, you know what, in a couple of years, we're all just going to be in shootouts all the time. And it's going to be super scary. And most people will be dead. And then it didn't happen. I, I like things that are set right before that drop off, when everything felt really terrifying. But do you think that was intentional? That they thought, okay, let's release a movie that ties into people's fears. Yeah, and you see that in other instances. You know, where like zombies mean this and vampires mean that. And then I think the idea of Predator and what people felt about like the urban environment went together well, right? As an extension of the jungle. Yeah. Yeah. But then what that was preying on stopped making sense within a couple years of that movie coming out, right? It's, it's dated. It's not that it's wrong, but it's, it's, it's tapping into the wrong fears because we've changed. I'm going to get all, all thoughtful now and hipster. Do you think that games can do that or is the development time too long on, on the larger titles? Yeah, they can. Well, they just have to be luckier than the Predator, right? I mean, who would know? that urban crime was going to plummet randomly in, what, like, like, the early 90s. So, I mean, if that hadn't happened, Predator 2 would still be this, like, you know, this this hallmark of the human experience. And I think games could could be lucky in that way. It is really this generation's battleship Potemkin. You may be slightly over-exaggerating its, uh, its cultural significance, but, I, you know, I certainly agree with the, you know, the vibe that was going around. And in a way, we're going back to that a bit with our, you know, our summer riots last year oh yeah they, you guys <laughs> yeah i know perhaps you're done with urban violence now but you know we can we can pick up where you left off in amazon in the uk that during the period of the riots i think the top selling items or items that jumped thousands of percent in the sales charts were baseball bats and shields and helmets yeah we didn't even play baseball that much here we called it rounders didn't we that's right it's, it's proper name yeah uh, girls play rounders. So you call baseball rounders? Yeah, we call baseball rounders, and it's something that everybody plays in school, and then they grow up and they never think about it again. You know what? I don't care about baseball, so for the sake of the show, I'm just gonna let that slide. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, why is it why is it called rounders though? Because you go, ah. you you run around a square, I suppose. Sorry, I guess most sports names don't really have a, a deep meaning. So it's yeah. I'm okay. sure it's roughly the shape of the uh, that you run after you've hit the ball. Yeah, round. Yeah, yeah. round. Basketball uh, was originally called box shot, <laughs> which I think is excellent um, because they had uh, apricot boxes on uh, on the wall. Let's let's talk about another example of urban decay. Do you think that Saints Row 3 says anything about our society, Danjo? It feels like it purposefully does not. 
the, the Saints as a popular gang have now become uh, hyper celebrities. Yeah. I can't even quite understand what, what kind of world you're living in. It feels like uh, Steve Zissou, right? Where something is popular and people are paying attention to it that makes no sense. So I don't, yeah, I don't think it's saying anything. The, I think you could say that about maybe the first and second, where they were almost lampooning the idea of people liking gang culture. And now it's gone far beyond that. And I think they're just in their own little zany world. I don't think it's unusual in that respect. I mean, we already have a model for the Yakuza who have comic books written about them. And I think they kind of fund their own um, uh, fund their own PR machine. And certainly there's a certain type of uh, a young man who will have uh, posters of Scarface on his wall or, or, you know, gangster rappers or whatever it is, or will, will not, you know, they rappers take on names like Noriega. The glamorization of gang culture is not unusual. Right. I think they're making fun of those people in real life with the older with the older games. But the third one has taken it so far. It's it's in another area. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, it, yeah. it feels almost like a parody of the parodies. Like they were lampooning even their earlier games. Like it's so crazy. Even the characters inside uh, Saints Row 3 are, are just sort of surprised at their own celebrity at times. Isn't that like a reflection of a lot of the uh, reality or what do they call it? Staged reality TV shows now where you have deliberately put people who aren't actually very good at anything or you don't have any talents, but they might have um, uh, enhanced breasts or, or slick hair and they, they kind of uh, glamorize them and follow them around throughout every detail of their lives. Um, is it kind of perhaps playing on that a bit? I don't think it's on purpose trying to say anything about the real world. I think they've decided if for Saints Row 3, the Saints, are, as a brand, are, in this fictional world, just the biggest thing for no good reason. And it, that's not actually communi- communicating anything. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> I could be wrong. I mean, I'm certainly willing for somebody to say, oh, no, this really means that. But to me, it just felt, yeah, a little too random. Uh, was it enjoyable, random? Yeah, if you just accept the bizarro worlds they're setting in front of you, then it's fun. Uh, they could take that part out of it; it'd still be just as fun. I don't, I don't think it brings anything to the table, but it's not annoying either. It's just, it just is. So you're saying that the setting doesn't matter at all, the humor doesn't matter at all. Not the, not the intentional setting or humor. No, yeah, it's not terribly important. So could you imagine those mechanics just being put into a totally different uh, gaming brand? Oh, well, the mechanics themselves are are trying are kind of asking for something ludicrous. But just something ludicrous, right? Yeah, there's probably a huge palette you could pull from. It, it would make just as little sense, but still be fine. If you could take that, that stupidness and put it into a different game or a different brand, what, what brand and game would that be? Could you have Saints Row Mass Effect? I guess you could. It's, it's not like it makes a whole lot of sense for Saints Row, the ludicrousness. I don't think it would make sense anywhere else either. But it doesn't need to because it's just a video game trapping. It's more like a toy box then than a than a anything narrative. Yes, and the toy box works, and the toy box would work with or without the ludicrousness, with with or without the specific genre. That's not terribly important. Do you think they could sell DLC DLC worlds? So you have the toy box, but you buy DLC that makes it toy box World War Two, or DLC that makes it toy box science fiction. Do you think Isn't, people would buy it? I've backed us into a corner by asking the wrong questions, but. The impression I've got is Saints Row 2 is really fun. Nothing th- nothing to do with the word Saints Row is important in the game whatsoever. Right. And I find that quite weird. It is a little weird, and I think maybe not on purpose. Do you know what I mean? They've succeeded in the sandbox area and perhaps failed on the coming up with recognizable characters that you give a shit about. But that failure is not terribly important. They could have just said... Here is a facsimile world which doesn't have any context. It doesn't even look like a world. It's just a series of blocks and so on. Just enough to make it look semi-realistic and go and play in it. And that would have been good enough. I don't know about that. I mean, the whole sort of hyper-reality bizarro land is kind of what makes it funny. Jumping on your flying motorcycle and then, and then flying through the city with giant skyscrapers with your, your character's likeness plastered all over them and like giant ads and without the world being at least some sort of world the just the crazy stuff that 
you are inflicting on the world, it wouldn't be as crazy. And you think the context of seeing a famous person flying around blowing people up is part of what makes it amusing? Yes. What strikes me is if you had an abstract kind of grey world, so the thing that would make it realistic or make it better is the context of having civilians in there. So of all the things you can make abstract, the, some, the one thing you can't would be the civilians. Yeah, probably, yes. People like tiny people that they can fuck with. Yes. <laughs> Ever since little computer people, uh, you've kind of you know been tinkering in the in the humdrum lives of other people by you know blowing them to small red mushy pulps or running them over and making it look like you've broken both their legs or you know seeing if you can how many you can scoop up in the blades of a helicopter across the beach or something like that. So I I suspect Dander and Lupus don't know what little computer people is. Sim in the in the olden days. <laughs> I imagine he was now with an Amish beard, Sim, just talking talk about this. <laughs> Come and sit on my knee, and I shall tell you a story from the <laughs> days of history. Uh, yes, Little Computer People is a very old computer program which made it seem as if you were, you know, like The Sims? It's like the premise of The Sims, but on much older computers with way worse graphics. And so you, you maimed these little people? Well, unfortunately, at the time, technology wasn't advanced enough to allow you to maim them. But uh, you could kind of um, uh, ig- ignore them, I suppose, was about the, the, the worst you could do. The characters you generate were sort of unique. So it kind of, you know, the, the, the computery programming bit was it essentially set up your own little person in that genre that became... The, the Sims, really, that was the, the nearest thing I can compare it to. In the same way that people spent hours trying to trap their Sims in the swimming pool and drown them because there was no real way to actually kill people. I think that's the kind of the, the nubbin of the, the Saints Row series, really, that you are given the opportunity to mess with the world and, and, and it encourages you to do so with the tools it gives you. I love the title, Little Computer People. I think that's, that's genius because uh, a friend and I have spoken about little computer people in that context right that okay. some of the fun of some of these games is there's these little people and there's no consequences for anything you do and it doesn't even have to be horrific like sometimes you just take their food off their table and throw it on the floor in front of them absolutely and that's hilarious for some reason i didn't realize it was an actual game called little computer people so are you like typing commands at them uh yeah it was it was text based uh there was, I'm pretty sure there was a simple subset of commands that you could uh, get them to... Oh, God, it's just so long ago. I'm th- was there a card game in it? Do you, do you know any of this at all? I know the, the name. I haven't ever played it. Right, yeah. I mean, they, they kind of inhabited the little house that you created for them. And, you know, watched, I think they watched TV. The reason I compared it to The Sims, I'm sure they, they cook and they... Uh, I think they read the newspaper and, and stuff like that. I'm sure there was a card game you could play with them. I don't, I don't remember what it was. And, and there was a subset of commands that you could use to, you know, to, to tell them what to do, you know, before they invite, invented mice so you could click on icons. It, it's that old. Interesting. I may have to look into this. This sounds fascinating. One would assume with the, you know, the internet, there must presumably be a playable version of it somewhere. And, of course, if you find an emulated version, you can probably go onto eBay and find the original cheaply. Of course, yes, you should definitely fund your defunct, probably, I mean, the programmers of this are probably dead. It was that long ago. Uh, oh, yeah, it oh, came man. on wax cylinders. <laughs> <That's how. laughs> when you said little computer people, the first thing that popped into my mind was populous. But no, no, yeah, apparently, yeah. This, is, this is much older, <laughs> apparently. It is older than populous, but I think, you know, that the vein of um, of, of having control over little people that you know obviously are not inside your computer but as a concept that's a way of a way of examining it and populous and power monger and all that kind of stuff works on that same thing you were you were saying about you know you get to mess around in these people's lives without any consequences it's like dolls or action figures in a way but you've given them a little bit of their own agency and Mm. i think that makes it more fun yeah, the pl- and that's, that's what Saints, yeah, I mean, GTA works off that, Saints Row works off that, Sims works off that. I mean, just really a lot of stuff. That's the fun part of Saints Row, that you're like a, that your face is on a billboard. To me, I don't even, it doesn't even really register. Have there been any games that have a story or some, some aspect which is first or third person uh, where you can also influence the surroundings? So I know that San Andreas, you could buy businesses and so on couldn't you uh yes but could you affect say the sewage or could you affect npc so that you you alter what they do so it's like a gta sims 
Yeah, I don't think there's been that crossover, has there, between these open world games we have now and things like SimCity and and all those other. You know, there's not really a great deal of resource management so so far. I imagine it would get very boring if you had total control over what the NPCs did. Right. Mm. What, one of the things I thought about Saints Row 3, and I, I read this on the, the Gamers with Jobs forum, I think a, a couple of different people posted it, uh, was the desire to replay one particular section or one mission in the game which uh, had uh, as the theme Kanye West's song's power. Mm. That's the first thing that I can remember reading about where people were doing a mission or replaying part of the game for the music. Mm. Which I found quite striking because I get the feeling there would be diminishing returns on that. Yeah, I don't know. I guess it's just sort of like uh, watching your favorite action movie, like rewinding to uh, your favorite scene or whatever when uh, all the shit goes to hell. It'd have to be fairly impressive to make me want to play it again, not necessarily just for the music, but, you know, sort of Red Dead Redemption did a thing, didn't it? Uh, am I allowed to talk about it without the risk of spoilers? Where you change countries, there's a, you know, a guitar riff kicks in and it's, you know, it's a memorable moment and it's a way they've used music really well and it fits with what's happening in the game at the time. But as, as awe-inspiring as it was at the time, I'm not sure I'd kind of reload a save just before that to to do it again i'm surprised that nobody has picked up on my not so subtle hint that this is worthy of discussion where somehow somebody has created a situation where a song is the primary motivation or at least the, kind of the, the headline motivation for replaying a section is i don't Kanye even rem- West- remember Sorry. that part of i surely i played it but it just what the hell like when you're robbing the bank at the very very beginning yeah i think so Huh. Yeah, because you you like jump out of the helicopter to like I think your parachute down on top of the the bank from the helicopter and the uh the music starts playing and you just I'm not one of the people that replayed it over and over so Yeah, it doesn't sound might... as memorable for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember it quite as well. Is this a song that people would have heard before? Yes. Okay. It was in the trailer, wasn't it? It was in the trailer for The Social Network. Okay. So maybe that's why it didn't click. Is because well, I don't do can... this stuff, and like so, sometimes music doesn't really have that impact if it's the first time you've heard it. Well, that was sort of one of the uh, running jokes of what the past E three or something like that, where there were multiple trailers that were using the same song, that that particular song. It's like the ES posthumous of the uh, video game trailer world. What's that? The the past decade, if you watch a trailer for a movie, yeah. there's a pretty good chance it's made by like this one guy, um, and it's the same music. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, it's just kind of not necessarily generic, but orchestral crescendo, you know, building up, which is exactly what a trailer is supposed to do. But, you know, there's one guy that made, I think, about four or five pieces that just, they might as well be called Trailer 1, Trailer 2, Trailer 3, and they get used so much. Yeah, when you said one man making this music, I assumed I just had an image of a one-man band. (laughs) Do you know know what I'm talking about? I don't think he's performing any of it, but he's... No, but do you know what a one-man band is? Yes. With, with he's got a hat that's a symbol and a bass job on his back and and an accordion <laughs> i just i just really like the idea of all films having a one man band soundtrack i don't think you really like that idea you're just saying you really like that idea <laughs> can you can you imagine then that in inception if you get <laughs> <laughs> the harmonica riff <laughs> yes <laughs> clanging along in the background no <laughs> that would be, that'd be fucking be amazing <laughs> Oh dear! It'd be really difficult to get those uh, amazing crescendos and stuff built. <laughs> You'd have to do it really fast. <laughs> <laughs> His leg would be going up and down. And, uh, <laughs> yes. Maybe they maybe they could have a thing like when they uh, you know they help the deaf people to to see what words are being used. They can have a little image of him in the bottom right of the screen. <laughs> do you have that in America? Do you have signing on on TV shows? Sometimes. It's always it's always on really late in the UK, which I think is a bit unfair because if deaf people want to watch films, they have to stay away till three in the morning, which is just really terrible. This isn't helping. Yeah, I feel the need to apologise to all involved. <laughs> yeah, for allowing us to go down this path. We could have done something about that. Didn't they have forty pieces of planned DLC or something? Yeah. So, okay. Good. Good. Good shout, Sim. 
So, Dadger and Lupus, have either of you bought this any of the Saints Row DLC? Good God, no. No. Okay. <laughs> uh, there's no interest. Uh, the only has there any been anything other than like the Nightblade stuff and the uh, Professor Genki's thing that just came out? I think uh, it's going slowly, isn't it? There's a there's a long yeah. release that's supposed to be releasing. I, I can't remember over what time scale, but it was it was something like forty bits over a year or something like that. Yeah, they can suck dicks. That's, uh, <laughs> that's like me. I don't know. I, I'm keeping an eye on it to see what comes out, but uh, no interest so far. So, if you had a choice between Saints Row Three and Saints Row Two, because of course, Sim, you played Saints Row Two. Yeah, a lot, a lot. Um, which would you suggest, guys? Now, would you say that Saints Row Two is still enough fun where you can get a kind of an all-in-one package for it? Um, can you get Game of the Year for that, Sim? Uh, I don't think there was ever enough kind of additional stuff released to make it worth it. A lot of it was clothing items and that that kind of thing, you know, in-game stuff like that. Oh, uh, there were there were two or three pieces of you know story and mission uh, DLC, but I don't think it was critically acclaimed enough for anyone to think of putting it all on a disc and trying to sell it again. It, it, I mean, the, the character creation uh, is one of the things that kind of allows you to tinker in many ways with uh, with who you want to be, doesn't it? There's all that transgender stuff, and you know, it's all it's all very accommodating. Can you really have transgender characters? Uh, you can have men dressed as women, but that. Well, you can have transvest- a guy that has a female body dressed in men's clothes, or the reverse, or any combination in between. Like, like breasts, no penis, but male voice. So gender ambiguous. I was thinking about this the other day, actually, yesterday, about how many transgender characters there are in games, uh, and I can only think of one, and that's Poison from Final Fight. Mm. You could walk your character in Saints Row Two or Three. Into a, a literally a like a office that just does this and change your character to the other gender. Yes, as many times as you want. So, I suppose it is transgender. Technically, that is, isn't it? Uh, more so than than like poison, right? I mean, she's written that way, or he. Whatever. Whereas this would be like as a player, you want to do this. So there you go. I wonder if any of the people playing it kind of made that decision as seriously or as serious as they can in that world. Or if it's just blokes who want... I don't understand men who play as female characters. I find that a bit weird. I'll only play as a female character if there's no other option, as in, say, a fighting game. Um, but the, the excuse that men seem to give, uh, or other men, because I'm a, a man, is that, uh, oh, I like looking at a, at a nice figure on the screen. Have you heard that before in MMOs and things? Yes, <laughs> certainly. Yeah, or I get more free things when I'm a female character. <laughs> yeah, I, that, that has happened to me, yeah. <laughs> Not intentionally. <laughs> Not intentionally. You didn't intentionally create a female character. Oh, I intentionally f- created a female character, but I had no, no intentions of of ex- exploiting other players to give me things. You didn't solicit all those gifts. They were just show- showered upon you. you yeah. Didn't slash dance <laughs> next to them. I <laughs> uh, can neither conform nor deny. <laughs> so once you, so men started giving you more stuff when you dressed as a woman, or other players did. I I habitually play as female characters. Right? Why? Uh, for the fun of it. I like seeing I like seeing strong female characters in games. Yeah, that sounds like bullshit, Lupus. No. That sounds like that's a very weird thing to say. I like seeing strong female characters in games. So I'm going to play as one. Well, there's yeah. the whole there's the whole femship argument, isn't there? You know, the Mass Effect has kind of created this, coined this femship phrase, where a lot of people. You know, I think very much for the reasons Lupus gives, really. Sort of, I don't know if it's because they want to see strong female characters, but uh, I don't think uh, it might make you uncomfortable. I don't think there's anything unnatural about playing as female characters. I, you know, I, similarly, I do too, but I, I don't know if I choose a preference. You know, I think I've, I've played Mass Effect, the first game, twice, once as a male character yeah. and, and a, again as a female character, because obviously you want to play once as a good person and once as an evil person. Not that I'm, you know, saying men are evil or vice versa. <laughs> I was going to ask. As a vehicle of fantasy, it's easier for me to fantasize about being the hero or the villain, whatever it is, if it's the same gender as I am. That seems odd, since the point, the purpose is fantasy, meaning you're, you know, you're essentially this puppet on screen that is not you. 
in many ways. So you may be a different species, you're flying around in space, you have all these other qualities, and you've chosen this one quality that needs to stay the same as to what you are in real life, and that feels well, very not, arbitrary it's not, it's to not me. The, it's not the one quality because, of course, there are a lot. You know, there are physiological differences between men and women, and there are societal differences as well. But not necessarily in games. Well, there will be in things like Mass Effect, and there clearly are in MMOs. But I don't think there is a societal difference in the sexes in in Mass Effect. You know, I think it's, it does that kind of Star Trek thing of homogenizing everybody, so that um, you know, you the equality is there. They don't have to infer equality. It, it just everyone is equal. You know, they don't treat you any differently. Some of the characters you encounter treat you differently because because right. they want to have a relationship of various sorts with you, but you're not looked up or down upon as a result of being a, a man or a woman they, you know your humanity is very much what sets you apart from most of the other characters in the game well, no, I mean, yeah but that makes sense in a fucking alien game of course <laughs> your hu- the primary thing would be that you're an alien but games games in general are not just in in science fiction but you know i think they do let you not it's not even about crossing boundaries i suppose about knocking them down uh, without you know maybe it's going back to that thing about little computer people you know without without consequence possibly i i maybe i'm maybe i'm just kind of i can't say old fashioned but it just doesn't appeal to me now when i do see female characters in computer games um i don't understand the need to always have them in skimpy clothing and have them have enormous tits i'd much rather see a female character who, if she was a fighter, would be wearing armor that was suitable and had a physique that was suitable. Because for me, that's that's an aspect of realism. It's only you talking about the skimpy clothing. What, what do you mean? Well, you know, well, that's how. You know, I, 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 you know, Lupus, I know, has played female characters, and I've played female characters, but I don't immediately yeah. dress them in almost nothing. No, but uh, yes, no, but I talked about female characters as in. Uh, avatars that you control or npcs yeah. often in games if they are lead characters well, where you don't have a look- choice you mean yeah okay mm. so for example soul caliber 5 which is being released on the 3rd of february in the uk uh namco i think it's bandai namco have put out a poster which has a line like i've got massive tits or look at these big ones or some stupid shit like that and it's just a pair uh. of it's just a shot of cleavage computer generated cleavage I they, think we can don't. all agree that that's pretty juvenile, and we know why they do that. That's that's not quite the same thing, and I can kind of agree with you in an MMO where uh, picking a gif- different gender is communicating something to a bunch of other players that is, uh, depending on how everyone's perceiving it, perhaps a bit deceptive. Not necessarily wrong, but I could see being averse to that. But in a game that's either single player or you're only going to be playing it like you know cooperatively, so people obviously can tell that you're really a guy... Um, that that seems like an arbit- arbitrary choice. I, I can understand why you say that. As uh, I mean, to make it clear, I don't have a problem playing female characters when there is only a female character. So, for example, in Mirror's Edge, or in Tomb Raider, or you know, Tomb Raider is kind of kind of on the cusp when it was first created about the realism of that. Um, I I suppose kind of reflecting it back on on Lupus and Sim, I it, it always seems to be something slightly underhand or slight, something kind of slightly seedy. Uh, about the men that play as female characters in MMOs or get a kick out of watching these uh, pixelated jubblies on screen. <laughs> I suppose the fact that I don't see it as seedy is probably why I... Shows that you are, because <laughs> perverts always think they're normal. <laughs> no, I mean, if I, I understand your, you know, how, you, how you look at it, but I, I guess I don't have that same... I, I, I don't mean hang-up, but I, I don't think it is seedy, and I think, I think I can see why you don't do it if you perceive it to... CD. I mean, I, I don't know why I'm thinking of Test Drive. I'm limited to now, but but, but I am. <laughs> but you know, it was it was a game sort of seated in its uh, its it giving you all these fashion items and furniture and and stuff like that. And there was a big discussion on the on their forums, Atari forums at the time, about you know all people who all men who play as women are either uh, oh, I can't remember they're, they're either. Like you say, they are trying to deceive people. I think a lot of teenagers were very disappointed when they got to talk to these, you know, what they that's stunning looking <laughs> women on the screen, and then you know, once they'd sent them kisses and hearts in a in a in a message over Xbox Live, were a little bit disconcerted to find out it's Dave from Scunthorpe or, or what have you. Yeah, so I I don't know, but I I it's interesting that you find it un, not uncomfortable that you choose not to. 
And yeah, maybe I should question my motives for that. But I don't think <laughs> I don't think it's just to, to you know I don't think it's for the purposes of titillation or, or viewing pixels of of women. I mean that just seems utterly pointless to me. Uh, yeah, no, I mean I know that you know even, I think it was in Planet Side where you had male and female characters, but they had the same hitboxes. Okay. Um, when they were shot, and so there wasn't any technical reason. Now you might say that. There's an argument in in a first person shooter where even if you've got the same size hit box, if your character is slightly smaller proportionally than than say the male character, it's an advantage. You can hide behind things more easily, or whatever it is. But that that's about as far as it goes for me. I guess I guess I'm just too damn masculine. <laughs> <laughs> that must be it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Okay, before Christmas, I bought myself a projector. And I'd wanted one for a few years, and uh, I bought uh, one called 720p, and I got it for a very good price. And it's it's kind of in like a budget projector, but it, it's good enough. And it's one called an Optoma HD67N. Now, if anybody's interested in, in getting a projector, I think broadly speaking, there are two types. I think LCD and DLP. One thing that isn't mentioned when you look at projectors online is something called the rainbow effect. And I don't know what the technical term is, but essentially the rainbow effect only happens with DLP projectors. It's like a ghosting on things in scenes that are high contrast, and it's a multicolored ghosting. And some people don't see it at all, and some people see it so badly that it gives them headaches. And I've read about people who bought a projector, but then... They want to return to the shop because they can't actually watch it. It makes them ill to watch it because they are susceptible to the rainbow effect. But they don't know if they can because, of course, the projector's working perfectly. It's just that the person hasn't done the research. See one in situ or in a shop before you buy because it, it might just be impossible for you to watch. The difference between uh, DLP and LCD, as far as I'm aware, is that the DLP has a slightly more cinematic quality to the image. It looks slightly more film-like. Um, so I suppose that's softer and nicer in the colours and so on. Before I had one, I thought it would be fantastic for games, and it would be it would be great for movies, and it, it would be a huge step up from from owning a television. And actually, it isn't. And in some ways, it's much less convenient because not only do you have to place it correctly and get it into focus, you you can't have it on for hours and hours because you start worrying about wearing the bulb out and the bulb is rated for about 2000 hours but i'm quite careful and also you can't you're not supposed to turn it on and off repeatedly so you kind of have to decide that what you're going to do is you're going to watch a film or you are going to play a game so what happens if you turn it off and on to it affects the bulb so so in fear of not being able to watch what you want to watch you're not watching what you want to watch no it means i'm more choosy I'm more selective. Previously, I just used to put the Xbox on if I was bored. But now you, you feel you have to have a whole block of time where you're going to use it you know, for, say, two hours rather than maybe having a quick half an hour and switching it off again. Yeah, because I, want it, I don't want to have it on for only half an hour. And actually, I read one piece of advice for a place called AV Forums, I think. This, is, this isn't stuff I've researched. It's just stuff I picked up from posts. And somebody said... You know, when I got my projector on and I want to go and make a cup of tea, should I turn it off? And the response was, no, leave it running. If you're only away for half an hour, leave it running because you don't want to have to cycle through the power all the time. Those guys know yeah. their stuff. They do. So what that means is a couple of things. I no longer am on the Xbox as much because I used to be on with Danjo and we used to chat and, and Danjo's friends. I don't do that anymore because I'm <laughs> I'm more concerned about wearing the projector bulb out than I am interested in speaking to Dan. <laughs> so, <laughs> so your projector has made you antisocial. It has made me antisocial. Stop you watching as many films or playing games. I watch more films, okay. but now now for some the problem with the projector is it's projecting an eight foot screen. And so when you're playing a shooting game or a first person shooter You have to stand outside. Yeah, yes, you have to go to somebody else's house across the street to play it. But I can't see everything in my peripheral vision. Right. Yeah. So how how is this a good idea? Because it's because films are fantastic on it and it is it is kind of 
it's kind of crazy to have an eight foot screen especially one that's in hd i had a realization the other day and i i don't think i would have had this had i not had the projector but the first time i played pac-man was in an, in an arcade in new york when i was a kid so this was in the 80s uh, in, a, in a pizza shop in New York on an arcade machine. I first played Street Fighter in an amusement arcade. And now I'm playing Pac-Man HD Remix and Super Street Fighter 4 in not only in HD, but in 5.1 surround sound on an 8-foot screen. you got to have 5.1 for Pac-Man. That's, uh, you got to have 5.1 for yeah. Pac-Man. And it was just such a... It's such a weird experience to know that not only have these franchise, franchises been around, but your experience of them although the core gameplay is pretty much the same how you perceive it has changed so much and in in a reasonably short space of time it feels to me as well isn't there a little a parable there maybe about the the gaming industry and how you know it's just kind of stuck in repeating generations of the same stuff albeit slightly prettier and perhaps with 5.1 surround sound i actually took it a different way i i kind of marveled at the longevity of these titles because you know they've outlasted films how many franchises so rambo was a franchise that lasted 20 years and star wars kind of was but it was re- resurrected in a bad way but how many films or how many tv series do you know that last 20 years well uh, last is a little bit different i think mm. well or or are are continually produced over such a, a long period uh, i think that's a little different that's different because, like, a show, they'd have to do it every single year. Whereas a game, we don't care if they skip years. I mean, we might care, but we still consider it consistent. And then with movies, quite often, I mean, they're going to have to switch out actors. And that just craps out sometimes. With the games, if you want to keep doing this, you know, every second or third year for 20 years, well, I mean, the actors aren't standing in your way, and you don't have to put out something every single year. It seems a little bit easier. But, you, but don't you think it's a testament to... Um, the quality of the gameplay or of the brand that they're able to do that. No, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I don't know. I think it's just take too long to think about. I, I don't know. It, it, is it? I mean, uh, let's take Pac-Man as the as the central example here because that you know that, that, that obviously hasn't changed as a gameplay experience. You know, you're just guiding a guy around the the lanes, eating stuff, popping cherries, and chasing ghosts. Popping cherries. Sorry, uh, eating the big pills and and you know getting your own back on the people who were previously about to to consume you but no, nothing's changed in that apart from like you say now you're playing it on an eight foot screen in in five foot one surround sound but is is it because it's a genius idea that that simple game or, or is it because they're just being remade all the time uh well there's only a, a handful <laughs> of franchises perhaps that have lasted that long i mean there's plenty of other titles and franchises that have died off long ago uh and certainly the same is for movies i mean you still have your star treks and your star wars and and they uh, remake stuff yeah yeah indiana jones it's things of that nature that have gone through the whole remake cycle but there's uh the industry's been around long enough that we can actually have things that have been around for decades and, and when people bring up pac-man like if something new comes out the word nostalgia is going to be in that description right which sure. seems to me to, to imply it's not that it's lasted this long. It's that people associate it with, you know, youth and are so like, yeah, Pac-Man, I'll get fucking Pac-Man. Like, you know what I mean? It's not like Pac-Man <laughs> has survived to this. Yeah, all these all these jocks on college campuses, fuck Pac-Man, yeah! <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. That, that's, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's it's nostalgia. It's not It's not like people that have watched The Simpsons for 20 years. Do you think the, the the nostalgia business has affected games like it's affected everybody else? And when eBay started to become popular, people like me in their thirties who yearned for their childhoods when everything was simpler bought things they couldn't have when they were a kid. Okay. Yeah. So whether it's board games or toys or electronic LC, you know, you know, uh, LCD games, whatever it is, and so there's kind of a nostalgia industry, and you see nostalgia industries in all sorts of places. If you watch shopping channels, they will have a hundred years of country and western, and all the stuff you loved when you were young. So it's Pac-Man, and all of these things are they just part of that? And actually, the gameplay is irrelevant, and it is nostalgia that is driving the purchase. I don't think it's irrelevant. I mean, it was a solid game. 
that's so it's enough, right? It's it's not it's not a shit game. Otherwise, even though people would be nostalgic, they wouldn't they wouldn't pony up the money for it. They remember having fun because it it was a good enough game to have fun with. But to suggest that you know Pac Man has somehow survived, it's like okay, I guess you needed a little bit of quality to the gameplay there. But uh, to me, it's a rehash. Uh, I mean, Pac Man is. A phenomenal, isn't it? Like like Space Invaders in a way. They're they're Space Invaders is rubbish. Yeah, okay, but but it it is something that you immediately know what I'm talking about. You know, I'm not just saying something like little computer people where where it's something that might be a little bit obscure. Everybody knows yeah. what Space Invaders is, and in, and in, indeed, it's another candidate that's been remade for XBLA and and whatnot, PSN, I guess. Um, and Pac Man and Street Fighter fall into that category and everyone knows double dragon don't they well not everyone but anyone who's played games for any amount of time will know what these things are they must have had a quality you know they must have been something good enough for people to comment on and to remember so they are good or they've been good but i don't know if that you know necessarily means that it's their it's their greatness which makes us buy them again or or perhaps there is a bit of nostalgia creeping in there. But, I mean, you're obviously having fun with it, and, you know, it's only cost you, like, £2,000 or whatever to get a projector to play it on, so it's got to be worth it, right? <laughs> the projector was very reasonable. It was £350. Okay, I, I exaggerate somewhat. But, you know, to play Pac-Man, that, that's a lot of money. Well, I didn't buy it just... <laughs> I did go, oh, I've got to play Pac-Man on an eight-foot screen. I, I mean, it was just... It was coincidental, but it, it just struck me. And, I, you know, I'd had Pac-Man before, and I was playing in HD, but just something about that experience where the only thing you can see is Pac-Man. Mm. It's Pac-Man in the horizon, right? That's it. Your entire wall is Pac-Man. That struck me. Yeah. Are you living the dream? Is that the strike? <laughs> I am living okay. the dream. Street- I, I, I didn't know which way you were taking that. I could tell that you were like having this moment, but I don't know if the moment was like <laughs> this ennui, like you've peaked, or <laughs> if just, just like, yes, this is the best, oh, and you'll just do this forever and be this content. This is a culmination of my existence. What have I become? <laughs> no! <laughs> yeah. My ennui is constant. I am never without it. and I, that I'm not actually joking. I'm, my life is like a bad fucking black and white French movie. But without the beautiful women, that—that's what my life is like. <laughs> Skyrim is actually quite hard to play on this projector. Is it because you can't take everything in all at the same time? I don't know what it is. It's just Skyrim. I find really difficult to play. It's oh. like the screen is too big for some things. Can you shrink mm. it? Like so my projector at school, like, there's a little knob on the front. I can shrink <laughs> the projected area. I can. So there, there's a type of projector called a short throw, which basically um, it means that even if it's quite close to your screen in my case it's just a, a textured wall which works okay it, you still get a full-size screen this is a, a regular throw projector so it's quite far back if i move it closer the screen will get smaller so i can do that but then it kind of defeats the purpose i i didn't i i bought this because i failed to get buy a big television in amazon's well, lightning deals yeah but a big television would be like a third the size of yeah, what would, you're talking about I mean, it's right crazy it's really crazy but the you're first... saying like it would defeat the purpose but then you're not playing a game because it's too big <laughs> but, but you won't make it smaller because you know what? what i mean this feels a little irrational when you game on a projector it isn't irrational at all because it's just so it's kind of crazy when you do it it really is. And you see details and things that you hadn't seen before just because the, the image is so fucking big. Well, now that seems a little weird to me because, like, my TV is 46 inches. So compared to your 8 feet, mm. it's a postage stamp. However, it's 1080p, so I have more fucking pixels than you do. And I can see all of them, right? Like, you, if you made my TV bigger, I wouldn't see any more stuff. There'd be no new information to pick up. So there's no way you're getting more information than I am. But my TV is much smaller. I mean, my you know projected area is going to be much smaller than yours. Put it this way, I can watch Star Trek episodes of Star Trek on a projector and notice details in the set and in the, in the in the texture of people's clothes and so on that I just had not seen before. That's because they remastered it. <laughs> no, no, this is not Blu-ray. It's just on the original discs. Mm. Okay. Well, I mean, I, yeah. Okay. Jumping to 720, you're going to get 
uh, better output. But to not want to compress that 720 image to be less than 8 feet, I don't think you're going to miss out on any pixels because as is, the pixels on your wall should be pretty large. They are quite large. Um, yeah. Mm. So fucking push the projector forward. Get a smaller <laughs> area, god damn it. I suppose I could do that. I mean, it, the thing is, it outputs quite a lot of light and heat. So it's at the moment, it's it's kind of lateral to me. So I don't. It's not necessarily in my field of view. But for films, it's fantastic. It sounds like a digital albatross. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? It's. I don't want to go back to my television now. Would you go back to a awesome television? I have I have a decent HD TV. I will use it for PlayStation games. And I'll use it for Wii, but that's because the resolution the resolution will be too low for that size of screen. I, I enjoy having it, and I wouldn't you know. And it was cheap enough that I can recommend this model if you check it out. The Octoma HD sixty seven or HD sixty seven N. But bear in mind that it is one of these things where you kind of have to prepare to use it. I gotta say that sounds terrible. That does not sound like a recommendation. No, but it stops me wasting time. But it's okay to waste time playing games, isn't it? Previously, I would just kind of put the Xbox on because I okay. didn't entertain myself with other things. And now I use my iPad a lot more. <laughs> so it's... <laughs> that's that's your advertisement for this product is it's so cumbersome it will cause you to appreciate every other aspect of your life more. <laughs> a bargain. Yes, a bargain. <laughs> I wonder what XCOM would look like on a large screen, simplicity. Well, it's interesting that we were talking about nostalgia, unless you've just edited that bit out. <laughs> <laughs> because um, uh, they are remaking uh, a version of an XCOM game, uh, not just the first-person shooter, which uh, you know is coming out next year now. I think it's been delayed. Uh, but they're remaking a... a tactical strategy game very much in the mold of ufo enemy unknown and i was thinking to myself when i saw this start to crop up on the am i allowed to talk about websites the game informer website they've been running right. a big a big series of stuff uh, about the new XCOM game and its artwork and where yeah. the developers are coming from because obviously there's a big fan base associated with the XCOM games and they're pretty um outspoken about how awesome the first lot of games were and i think quite defensive about the possibility that you know other games since then and potential future games might not be as good um so i went back and i started playing it again and it's uh, it's fantastic it's, and you uh, played it before i played it a lot before yeah i mean i was at university when it first came out so uh, I, I I did end up buying it uh, twice, I think. But at the time, it was just one of those things that got disseminated via what was the beginnings of the internet. You know, we all kind of grabbed stuff for free. Uh, this isn't really relevant, is it? Anyway, so all my student friends had it. I was a student, and I spent most of my time drinking in the evenings and in the daytime when I should have been, you know, writing essays and revising, playing XCOM. Uh, and, uh, it you know, it, it consumed many hours of my life and has continued to do so over the last couple of weeks while i've been revisiting it i, I guess the reason i i, I kind of note that you, know, you, you hit this before is not for the nostalgic reason but it's almost like you've been inoculated to an old interface okay right you, so I mean, like you're probably not going to find that very painful because eh, you know it or you, you you can kind of activate those parts of your brain that just kind of can flit about and do what you need to do without having to really worry about it the only time i ever tried to play xcom it was just it was rough yeah i mean going back to it i think i've you know it's a good question because i've noticed exactly that you know at the time i didn't notice quite how cumbersome it was and now I can certainly see how cumbersome it is. So there was a discussion about, you know, the, the new developers streamlining it, which immediately provoked people saying, oh, my God, they're dumbing it down for console users and all that kind of thing. But I think there's a really good case to, you know, there's a load of extra screens you don't want to have to click buttons on. And, you know, there's a load of stuff that hasn't been done in a very fluid way in the original game. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. Yeah, that doesn't sound like dumbing down to me. I My impression from the first game, and I probably tried to play it for like two hours or so, was this is begging to be streamlined in a way that doesn't actually touch any of the gameplay. 
it just allows you to do what you can do in the game already faster. Absolutely. Um, and you, we all have games like that where, like, you can go back to it, and it's going to be super fun for you. But I've got my other game that I got used to when I was, you know, in high school, and so I had all this time to just not care about how hard it is to actually play it, and just got used to it. it the XCOM has always felt like one of those to me. Yeah, not to mention the fact that it was unforgiving. You know, as a game, it was uh, it was punishing to the to the player in the fact that you'd you know frequently lose all the people you'd spent hours investing training time in and all that kind of stuff but but yeah so even though it has those peculiarities the interface it hasn't stopped me enjoying the game sort of 16 years later although i'm conscious of the fact that it's unwieldy to play it um it the pc that i'm running on is so much quicker than the one i ran it on back then that i can click through all these screens without really noticing that they're there whereas right. 16 years ago it might have taken three or four or five seconds to load these things you know each as you're clicking from one screen to another adding up to a total of you know 20 or 30 seconds of stoppage time and that maybe there's just something about the pc i played on now it all goes more smoothly because it's the same software running on much quicker hardware but there's still a case to take out a load of extraneous stuff uh, but the core game is um, is still really really good if you had to describe the core game to somebody uh, using kind of genre titles, what would it be? It's a turn-based 3D isometric tactical game. I'd like to say strategy game, but it's you know it's it's a it's a small scale. You're usually talking in terms of sort of eight to fourteen troops, sometimes with a you know tank or something, and each one of them you have a certain number of action points for, and you use those in either moving, shooting, picking stuff up, dropping stuff, throwing grenades, and using your various other abilities like opening doors. I mean, it's fairly rudimentary. The actual things you can do are fairly rudimentary, but the maps are randomly generated each time. And you, as you use your little computer people to shoot at aliens, they gain skills from the things they do. So if they're caused to panic and run away, then perhaps their bravery will increase you know, if they're not shot in the back. And if they manage to shoot and kill people, their, you know, shooting skills go up. Um, so it has a bit of that progression in it without it being an RPG in any sense. So in XCOM, not only do you have that tactical part, right? Yeah. Don't you also get like a, like a layer higher where you're moving these people around the earth and deciding what resources go where? Well, in the original game, you could... Uh, place up to eight bases uh, around the, the globe. There's a real-time G-escape, as it was called, and you got to choose what, what time units pass. So it can be five seconds, a minute, five minutes, 30 minutes, or a day. And that kind of basically makes the shadow of the sun going around the world make it look as if it's rotating around. And you could rotate this world fully in 3D. You know, it's a, it was a relatively impressive piece of tech at the time, and now it just looks like something sub iphone but um your base placement was important because that gave you your radar ranges and then the ufos would come in through the atmosphere and all that stuff would happen in quote real time unquote where you'd launch your fighters and they'd shoot down the ufos or sometimes you might mention sorry or sometimes you might notice that the aliens had built a base uh, and you'd have to sort of hunt them down and, and kill them once you'd got to the crash sites or the bases then the game's 3d isometric thing would take over that's kind of interesting though like I, I would expect the opposite if somebody were to design a game around this premise now where the the higher level strategic global perspective is real time but then in the lower level in the streets it's turn-based and i would expect that to be the opposite like if you were just to describe this to me but not tell me which was which um that's not the way i would imagine it so you'd expect the action to be real time. Yeah. I, something about me, the turn-based thing makes me think global and strategy, whereas tactics makes me think fluid and real time. Uh, and not that I think it wouldn't work the other way around. It's just, it feels a little inverted from what I would uh, find intuitive. I mean, later uh, versions of the XCOM games did, I mean, uh, XCOM Apocalypse toyed with the concept of having both turn-based and real-time versions of the on-the-ground combat which which sort of worked 
but it was you know it was no improvement over over the original games. I wonder if this one coming out might look a little bit more like uh, instead of a chessboard because it was grid based, right? Yeah, it was on a, a, a four sided square grid. Yeah, I wonder if they'll look to something like Frozen Synapse. Uh, from the looks of the screen so far, I think they're sticking with the turn based style. I think they've gone to hexes instead of squares, but I don't actually think they're messing too much with that core mechanic. And I, I think to some extent that's because of the fans of the original game. You know, I think they're, that's, that's going to be their initial market. Is it, is it worth somebody who is, of course, able to find the original disc on eBay or some other auction site uh, downloading maybe this game and playing it now i mean what steps did you have to go through to be able to play it okay i mean i still have my my cd from the olden days so i didn't have to acquire it but i'm pretty sure it's on steam now you can you can download it on Mm. steam for for a relatively small amount of money it it has a purity about it you know we talked about pac-man and that that has a purity doesn't it and 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 i don't think you can take away from how great the turn-based game mechanic is you know and there's and you're partially invested in it because of the fact that you don't really want to lose your your soldiers your little computer people you know you're essentially grooming them for greatness uh, and you 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 want them to live and this is i guess at a time when gaming wasn't just about saving and loading all the time to to undo the things that have gone wrong but your your guys do die a lot <laughs> yeah, especially job. early on. I mean, there, there is a whole yeah. technological progression which makes you gradually more powerful. You know, it's a it's a hook for a lot of games, isn't it? But yeah, certainly early on, it's it is brutal. Yeah, so, I think I I think I picked this up on on Steam on sale uh, a year or two back, and I made the mistake of not looking up any like Wikipedia or or walkthrough or anything of the sort. Okay. So <laughs> my my first experience of going into combat was just waves yes. of men coming off the transport into what was gunfire. essentially complete darkness and gunfire. Yeah. And having no no uh, idea okay. what was I up against. Uh it's quite terrifying actually. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's where it becomes you know, it, sort of that tactical element is is sometimes you want to deliberately in the real time geoscape you want to plan so that you only land on the crash sites in the daytime in a lot of cases because otherwise all that stuff about line of sight goes out the window because it also reduces your sight range down to almost nothing at night time uh, and it kind of it's a game that has a lot of elements like that. Uh, without making a big fuss about them, so it's just the world as it exists, as as in not in real life, but you know it takes all these factors into account and it never presents you with them in a statistical manner. It just you know brutalizes you for not noticing it. I suppose. I mean, it, there are mm. little torch grenades that you can throw out to make it lighter everywhere, and there are incendiary weapons so you can you know set light to all the towns you're supposed to be protecting, just so you can see where the aliens are. Um, but yeah, it 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 is brutal do you think there's a kind of um assumption that bad looking games will be easy to play because oh look the technology wasn't that good how difficult can it be they don't have complex systems running there etc etc uh no i think one of the things that the games that have tried to copy it since have got wrong is that the systems have been too simple you know i think there is a lot of complexity i mean it is you know, we talk about frozen synapse and the, at the heart of that game is lines of sight and timing, isn't it? It's about how much time your men have to point in the right direction and to shoot. And that is what XCOM does as well. So I, 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 I don't think you can mask that with the fact that XCOM has, by today's standards, terrible graphics. It's still worth, worth getting now. I'd, Do you think? I'd recommend it to anyone, although it is, you know, it's a game that requires patience and playtime. You know, you're going to have to make sure you've got a good couple of hours initially to to sit down and and play it i would say there's nothing to stop you saving and coming back to it but it's it's involving and i guess it deserves to have time put aside for it just going to say so we can add some color to the saints row discussion uh, in post-production what i laughingly call editing uh, Danjo and Lupus, what were your best 
Saints Row moments. Not necessarily the craziest ones, but well, they can be, but just things that stick out for you. Lupus, if you start. Hmm. Great, great start. <laughs> mm. uh, I'm trying to think of in- individual <laughs> moments. I'm not. Lupus, if you if you were a musical instrument, I think you'd be a punctured bagpipe. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> broken just... slide whistle. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any particular moments. I, I think there were some fun moments where, uh, no, I like I ramped a car off of like a drawbridge that was going up, and the game sort of recognized that I was doing this and sort of went into a, a cutaway. Uh, yeah, like a slow motion cutscene. Like cinematic, yeah, yeah, camera shot while I was doing this for a moment. I went back and it's like, oh. That was interesting. <laughs> it's one of those things where it's just the moment-to-moment antics where you're flying across the city, you eject out, you parachute down, you're going to shoot some guy, and then you're, the vehicle, whatever you were flying happens to crash next to you and sets half the traffic on fire, and you pissed off the cop in the process, and now you've got a gang war and the cops after you all at the same time. It's just the yeah. moment the moment chaos. I, I can't think of anything particular other than, say, some of the uh, like the scripted moments mm. early on that were a lot of fun. And Dan, Dan Joe, you said that there weren't enough scripted moments, didn't no, you? No, I don't really want scripted moments at all, so that doesn't really do it for me. But uh, I think yeah, I've only played it co-op, mm. and when we both realized that uh, leaping off a tall building, or in this case a helipad, the per- the character animates correctly like it looks like he's diving into a pool of water you mm-hmm. know what i mean like he yeah. really goes for it like i'm just going to dive off this building and we just did that over and over again for for a while like he's just diving off the uh, helipad pulling a, uh, the rip cord at the last possible second running back in the front door and taking the elevator and doing it again cuz you know you get this parachute they'll just go and go and go that was, that was really fun uh it's kind of simple and kind of a- ignoring what the game is supposed to be a little bit. Uh, also really like the little speeder bikes you get towards the end. They're like hover mm. one man, pretty much like speeders from star Wars, except they can mm. fly like they can hover and they can fly uh, and they go really fucking fast and they're very maneuverable. And that's just stupidly fun because <laughs> fast maneuverable things always are. It's weird. It sounds like none of you actually had like massive, massive fun with it or not memorable fun it's so zany and the pacing i mean you start off like breaking out of a huge jet only to crash through the front windshield and like zip through it again Mm. all the the whole time the thing is crashing like it's so over the top like there should be 12 nicholas cages all over the place (laughs) all the time (laughs) that makes things not terribly memorable you know what i mean you're just you're on top all the time if you're progressing progressing through the levels. Yeah. So what's memorable to memorable to me is when we stop doing that and just start farting around, um, which is not as over the top because we're not partaking in their their zaniness. Hmm. Mm. Yeah. I, just thinking now, I do remember a few of my uh, more favorite moments were pretty much just uh, starting some chaos, lighting things on fire, and then sort of panning the camera away as I intentionally have my character just walk at a slow gate walking away from the burning wreckage just so i can get sort of like that cinematic moment with uh my character walking. <laughs> yeah. why is it we always do that it's so nonchalant it looks, as well it looks yeah. cool i know but it's the equivalent of of say decorating tv shows having people walk in slow motion to the reservoir dogs music which I can't stand anymore. <laughs> but right. I think this is far less out of place, isn't it? When you do that in a game, you know, you're kind of admiring your own handiwork. In a way, you're not trying to kind of create some pastiche which doesn't work. Yeah, because if somebody does that in a, especially a movie that's somewhat serious, it always looks a little stupid because in <laughs> reality, you should be hauling ass. This is a dangerous situation. You should get away from it. <laughs> Or you should be an insane yes. character that's just really getting off on it, but not this weird <laughs> nonchalant in between. But in a game, you know, it's not you, so there's no consequences. And if, if an explosion happens and a car door zips through the air and bunks you in the back of the head, bonus. That's hilarious. <laughs> so it, yeah. it makes a little bit more sense than a video game, I think. 
I think one thing that might might keep it from having these memorable moments is, uh, you know, every game has a, uh, you're going to progress and get stronger and better and upgrade yourself in certain ways. Mm. Uh, this one pretty much takes it to God mode. Like, without really yeah. paying attention, mm. you know, you're buying property, you're gaining money, you're spending the money on yourself to upgrade how much damage you do and all this stuff. At near the the ends, maybe like 75% of the way through it, you're not taking bullet damage, you're not taking fall damage, you're not taking fire, explosion damage. You're pretty much playing on god mode, and I don't know why I'm saying pretty much, like you are. <laughs> and I think that negates either experimental or, you know, scripted fun and, and mem- being memorable because you are just this godlike entity floating through chaos. How would you make god mode fun? Or do you think that just it can't be? These things are probably mutually exclusive, aren't they? I mean, if there is no risk, it, it, so, there's probably no interest. What, 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 what I know, Danjo, we were on talking on the internet while you were playing GTA 4 on the PC, which was modded. And uh, it, you weren't in God mode, but you could certainly influence the world in very strange ways. So you had kind of, you could hit people, they were going to kind of anti gravity state, you could run very fast. And you were laughing all the time. So is it that you have to give people the the power to to, to cock about with the simulation, and that's that's when God mode becomes interesting? Yeah, I, yeah. I didn't have God mode on, and that was irrelevant at that point. At that point, I was fucking around with little computer people in hilarious ways, <laughs> um, and that was really funny. I think the simulation in any of the Saints Row games, Saints Row games, is not quite up to that. Um, it needs to be a little tension. You need to be a character in the world that's going through crazy stuff but could uh, potentially lose somehow. Uh, and I, I guess part of the problem is you just kind of naturally stumble into this because it's a progression like, okay, you take less damage. Now you take less damage. Oops, now you take none. And there's no take backs. You'd have to start the game over to gain your mortality back. Uh, I don't even know so if I you, could you, die at this you point. You didn't even choose to do that. It just gave you it. Um, it may describe what it is that you're upgrading, like over on the side, but it becomes right. automatic that you know you level up, and that unlocks things that you can now purchase. Well, it just becomes right. automatic that every time you level up, you go through your little cell phone, you hit everything that's bold and new, and go, "I got that, I got that, I got that." Mm. So you get everything, and everything happens to include immortality. You, you don't have you, to purchase it, though. You do not have to. No, right. You could just let people turn it off again. That would be nice. Yeah, kind of like Metroid, right? You get these upgrades, but then you can go in and if you feel like it, you know, you don't shoot missiles anymore. Um, and what about if they, if you were allowed to have a random mode where you, it would, it would shut, you could activate random mode and it would occasionally would just shut stuff off without you knowing about it or alter its properties. So you think you'll make, you think you'll make the jump of the building, but you won't. Um, I, I think that could be funny with other qualities. Maybe yeah. weirder ones, like maybe you can leap a mile, mm. but you don't know if you can or can't. So it's until, not that you don't... Until you actually jump, yeah. Yeah, and even like the god mode part, like the fall damage, you know, you leave that on. But if if we've given you the Matrix jump ability, you're going to make it. And if we haven't, you aren't. <laughs> and you're not going to know until you do it. Something like that could be funny. There's mm. no fun in opening the parachute at the last minute if you know that it doesn't matter if you right. don't open it in time. One thing I, I'll mention before we wrap up is I've, I'm only two or three days away from not having bought anything for a month, uh, entertainment related. Because of the projector. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because, because of the projector, but I just, I kind of decided that I was, I spent a lot of money in a short amount of time, um, or what I considered to be a lot of money. No, you don't have any money left. I don't have any money left. And uh, I, I just thought I should try to, play the games i've already got and really think about what i want to buy before i I buy anything and it's been incredibly difficult it really has why what do Um, you want to get but you're not because i would buy things for the promise of the experience so i'll tell you what i bought i bought some flour because i'm making my own bread which is very gaming related and uh, i bought a weighing scale and some nuts to fix a joystick i haven't bought anything else that means no xbox live indie games no arcade games no xbox sales no cheap games on steam even if a game is cheap on 
say on Amazon or on any of the retail shops in the UK. I haven't bought it. I haven't bought any books. You should really uh, pick up Quarrel too on the on the XBLA. It's it's, it's really good and only four hundred points. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. Only four hundred points. Only four hundred points. But you have to buy the marks of points in blocks. So that's say ten pounds or twenty pounds, and what I've realised is I've just I got used to buying things for entertainment, and justifying it by saying, "Oh, it's only a little bit of money." You've been nickel and dimed to to nothingness. Yeah. When you don't buy anything purposefully, so of course I I bought things I needed, but but nothing for entertainment. You you become aware of how much time you spend or one spends looking at Amazon or looking at shopping sites or browsing eBay and thinking, oh, wouldn't this board game be interesting? Or this is, this is oh, I hear this is limited run of this game or this book or whatever it is. Oh, that makes it exciting to me. I better buy it now. And then you don't. Do Wait, you're still looking at this stuff. Yeah, I've, I've stopped window browsing as much. I think you should continue this uh, process even if you do get the money. I'm thinking of doing it. What I've what I realised is is that if I'm if I have can't sleep one night and I browse the internet, essentially I'm I'm not drunk, but I'm not thinking properly. So that's when I make my drunk purchases. Why is don't it... you use that time to play some of the stuff you've already mentioned just now that you you know you're not playing? You you will feel like you ought to perhaps use this opportunity where you're not buying new stuff to go back and you know invest some time in that stuff you've already spent money on. Well, that that's what I'm I'm planning to do i've got to last until the 31st and then i can start buying stuff again uh but the game i want to next game i want to buy is called bushido blade which is a playstation one fighting game oh, yes, with weapons yes. I, I know it um where for people who aren't aware of it i mean sim if you describe it at face value it's a very simple sword fighting game but it depends upon your skill rather than any kind of power-ups or or we- character moves or anything like that you know you're you're essentially just given a guy with a sword and so is your opponent and uh yeah it's pretty pretty hardcore sorry it's pretty pure in its in its gaming experience so yeah as far as i know there are no health bars in this so essentially there are two there are i think there's states yeah i think there's a wound and then there's a dead and you, you want to avoid those so if your legs are wounded you can't you can't walk properly, or you can't. If your arms are wounded, you can't swing your sword properly. But yep. it's those, or you're killed. Yes, uh, and that sounds really appealing. And that's say seven pounds or eight pounds on eBay. That, that's what I want to buy next. And although it's only seven or eight pounds, I haven't been able to buy it because I'm on this thing where I can't buy anything for a month. Good. It sounds it's a it's a first world problem. Yeah, you're you're just imposing these kind of uh, these ideas around this whole issue. You know, it's good that you've not bought anything, and it's probably good that you should play some of the stuff you already have yeah i mean can can you guys relate to this thing where you buy things because it promises an experience um and but you don't know when you'll actually get to play it i never i never buy something that i'm not going to play right then i I feel the same way yeah i want to get my my money's worth out of it i think well, let me not lie to you. I do occasionally jump on deals if it's something I know I'm going to play cooperatively. Like, we've already talked about it. Like, oh, yeah, we're totally going to get this. I'm like, hey, I can get it for 20 bucks. I'll just hang on to it until they feel like playing it. But that's that's it. I don't think I'm alone in this. I mean, if you look at... No, always... no. Um, and actually, one of your one of your friends, Dan Joe, we don't normally mention names, uh, which is a guy called Chiggy. He had a very good idea. He kind of mentioned it in passing. I think it's very clever. Um, which he summarized as uh, two years and ten dollars, which was kind of a challenge to me, and this was last year. And I'd like to, if if people want to try and not buy any games for a month, um, any listeners, and tell us how they get on, then uh, you know, do try that. Although you might find it more difficult than you think, you might find it more difficult than you think. But two years and ten dollars is pretty simple. Which is. Uh, the next game you buy, or X games you buy, they have to be at least two years old, and they can't cost any more than ten dollars. Um, so in the UK, it would be two years and ten pounds. And what that means is, it not only saves you money, but it forces you to kind of think more about what you want to play and to take time looking at older games and considering them. Um, and so, because of two years and ten dollars last year, I bought Indiana Jones. The Xbox game, which is fun but has technical issues, and uh, Headhunter, which was a, a Dreamcast game, which I bought for the PlayStation 2, which I'll be playing. M- maybe I'll be playing it now. Um, but, 
but I, 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 I recommend trying it out. And so we come to the end of another show. Now, if you decide to try out the two years and ten dollars experiment or my ascetic version of that, then please let us know how you get on. Uh, especially if you find a game uh, that you really liked and you think other people should play, or conversely, if you find a game that's that's awful, warn us about those as well. Now, in the show notes, I will include a link to a video interview that I saw a few days before we recorded, which is with a transgender woman who happens to be a photographer of fighting game players. So she goes to tournaments and so on and, and takes photos of the fighting game celebrities. And that's what prompted my discussion in the Saints Row 3 section, and uh, I think it's worth listening to. Now, there are various ways to get in touch with us. All of them, really, uh, you can be found by going to our homepage at hatchetjob.com. Uh, and on there, you will find links to iTunes and our RSS feed, which are the best ways of keeping up with the show uh, because we don't have a set recording schedule. We do have a few videos up on YouTube as well. Uh, our username is hatchetjob.com. And if you're feeling brave and want to ring us, we have an answering machine over here in London. And the number is 0207 193 We're going to play out with a track called What's Wrong Baby, the CDK dubstep chill mix by CDK. And it is an angry dubstep. It's more relaxed than that. And I think it would be good as background music in a sci-fi game or the latest Deus Ex game. That's it from us. Thanks for listening. We shall speak to you next time. You've never known